Good morning, brothers and sisters, and very happy Sabbath. As we continue in our studies that began with minor prophets, and we're showing different portions of other prophets that relate specifically to the end of the world. We are now going to enter into a review and study of Ezekiel chapter 20. Shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his blessing and his guidance as we open this book of this prophet and consider the words for the time in which we are living? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these Sabbath hours. We thank you for the opportunity we have to come before you, to learn of you, and to come to understand that which we are to know now for this time in earth's history. Please guide us. Help us now as we assemble together. For as you have promised, where two or more are gathered, there I will be also. We invite you into this study. We ask for your angels to attend us. We ask that the Spirit guide us. Show us, Father, that that you would have us to know. May these words be written upon our hearts. May we come to understand these things more clearly so that we may give the message that you would have given to this world at the end of its history. Please forgive us of our sins. Please direct us now so that our steps may walk softly before you. For this we thank you and for this we praise you now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, for many of us, this is going to be a, a review of study that was done almost three years ago. We're going it back into Ezekiel chapter 20. Because in the portion that we were reviewing that set us on this path, Ezekiel 20 is part of what we're going to need to understand regarding the end of the age. As I recall, this is Ezekiel's third vision. Is that not correct, Brother Theodore? Yeah, this is the, the third vision. The second one is in chapter 8. It begins in chapter 8 and runs through chapter 19, correct? Yeah. And, now, and the idea in Ezekiel is that um, he dates each of his visions. Yes. Right. So there are 13 uh, visions that he has. There's 13 dates that he gives. Okay. Now, in the titles that were provided in the 1769 Oxford Revised King James. We find that verse 1, God refuses to be consulted by the elders of Israel. He rehearses the rebellions of their ancestors in Egypt. He rehearses their rebellions in the wilderness. He rehearses their rebellions in the promised land. And he reproaches the present generation that are just as corrupt as the prior generations. Now, we operate un under a premise that the prophets have written more for our time than they did for their own. With that in mind, can we apply then that we have been under the reproach of God for acting 
very much like our spiritual forefathers have done. By verse, yes, I think. Go ahead, please. I was just saying, yes, I think so, because as it was, so it is now. Okay. Now, by verse 33, God threatens to rule over them with rigor, but with promise to gather them to purge out the rebels and to accept the services of the faithful in his church. By the time we get to verse 45, we see the destruction of Jerusalem under the name of a forest. Do we really want God ruling over us with fierceness? Here we are shown that there will be presented a promise to gather the faithful together to purge out the rebels and to accept the services of the faithful in his church. Now, as we begin this study, Ezekiel 20, verse 1, And it came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. What's happening here? What, what application could we make relative to this in our time? Okay, well, I mean, the, the application here, because when we came up with July 18, 2020, uh, we first arrived at July 18, 2020, based on Ezekiel, um, the prophecy of Ezekiel. And um, this, this was, of course, July 31st, 2020, on the Gregorian calendar, July 18, 2020, on the Julian. And that's the 10th day of the fifth month. So we have this symbol that comes from... Uh, the date that Jerusalem is destroyed both in 586 BC and 70 AD, or the temple specifically is destroyed. So um, the certain of elders of Israel coming to inquire of the Lord, um, this seemed that, you know, in some way there was going to be some inquiry into in regard to our message. And, and then when we came up to, with July 18 on the Gregorian calendar, 13 days apart, these two dates are the 26th day of the fourth month from Revelation 9, then, it, you know, the idea was, well, if that event occurs on July 18, that this would be the church seeking, um, you know, inquiring regarding this, uh, you know, this failed prediction. But that didn't happen. So right. to understand this application then, uh, I'm not really sure how to understand it. Um, other than we do know that in not so much the event occurring, uh, but even just the prediction itself, uh, the church did draw, it did draw attention of the church to this message. Right. And, and I know that my... Uh, my pastor, Pastor Jason, he was, there was, I guess, a group of elite pastors in North America that when that um, publication in the Tennessean was uh, talked about, they, they actually asked him about me because they knew that I was the one responsible for that prediction. And um, so he talked to me about it. But exactly when they inquired of him, I never asked that question. Okay. And I don't remember exactly when he talked to me about it. I know it was sometime after July 18, you know, like 
quite a bit after that he told me about it. But um, so we don't know necessarily whether this was even fulfilled on that day or in some other way. But uh, I don't know how we would necessarily apply it now because I've thought about it. So I don't know. I don't have a good okay. answer. Now, it's interesting because when the translators were putting this together, the references that they used regarding the certain elders of Israel were Ezekiel 8.1 and Ezekiel 14.1, both contained in the prior vision. And Ezekiel 8.1 reads, And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Now there now, we have Judah. What's that? There we have the elders of Judah. Instead of the elders of Israel. But in Ezekiel 14, 1, then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. Mm -hmm. So, in this situation, we are seeing that there are there, there is a, a type of separation. First, the elders of Judah come to Ezekiel. And then six chapters later, it is the elders of Israel, as it is right here. So, so we know that it's, it's not, a, uh, I mean, the elders of Israel don't exist. So there is no such thing as the elders of Israel as a separate group. Okay. Because northern Israel has been scattered, never to be gathered. Um, so, but people have trouble with this. Why is he choosing Israel on on two occasions and Judah, the elders of Judah, on another occasion? And, and there's a lot of speculation about this, uh, especially when you deal with Ezekiel chapter 4, where it talks about lying on his left side, uh, for 390 days um, to bear the iniquities of the house of Israel and on his right side for 40 days to bear the iniquities of the house of Judah. And, and um, uh, so, you know, the question is why, like, why is he using Israel here? And then the elders of Israel. And, and so there's not really a solid answer why he does that. And is he, in some way referring to this prophecy symbolically when he calls them the elders of Israel or when he calls them the elders of Judah. Well, later on, we have the two sticks being mentioned of Israel and Judah or Ephraim. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be a bit of a theme even before that there is in Ezekiel 37. It mentions two nations, and uh, I think it's in relation to Edom seeking the land to possess the land of these two nations. Now we know that Israel had basically been taken over by Assyria over a hundred years prior, but it seems to have this here sort of relationship, uh, considering Israel as if they're still existing, seems to be quite a bit consistent theme in uh, a lot of Ezekiel's writings. So we know that that there, Ezekiel, uh, well, we've made the application that Israel is applying to the Protestants and then Judah, the Seventh-day Adventist Church at the end of the world. So to me, I would sort of have to, an idea to think, and how does this then fit into that aspect of the joining of the two sticks at the end of the world? Yeah, that's. I think that's the idea that that I have in that. Um, so one of the things we see in Ezekiel, he's going to talk about, uh, and and I can't remember. I think that's in the second vision, where he's talking 
about uh, the cauldron. Can't remember what chapter it is. So the the people in Judah believe that they're protected because they're God's people. They despise those that have been scattered. So they despise northern Israel. Northern Israel justifiably was scattered because they were idolatrous. But they're in Judah and they're protected. And then that cauldron, which they see as a wall of protection, is going to become something that they're cooked in. That's sort of how Ezekiel puts it. Uh, I'm paraphrasing. Right. So, um, so, so there is this contrast between um, uh, Judah and Israel, but Israel symbolically represents the Protestants, as Stephen says. So that that Ezekiel understands the the nature of the twenty five, the two twenty five twenties. Because Ezekiel is addressing Leviticus 26, especially in uh, chapter 4 and 5. Right. So, so there is something there, but there isn't from a, you know, if you're just taking Ezekiel as, you know, he's just a guy writing in, you know, the 6th century BC, and he's writing about what's going to happen there locally and literally, then there's it's kind of inexplicable why he addresses Israel and Judah. Because Israel is no more, right? And right, but we're at, at this point, we're examining this in light of what's going on today. We're right. accepting this as being for today. So the explanation that Stephen is giving mm -hmm. that this is the two sticks one of Adventism, one of Protestantism, and being joined, I think, plays right into what we're addressing here. Yeah, so that so that's the whole point of this. Ezekiel must be speaking of the end of the world. Right. Just be speaking about what's happening there. Because it would, it would make no sense for him to be doing that. And just like he's predicting the destruction of Jerusalem in 586, of the temple specifically on the 10th day of the seventh, uh, 10th day of the fifth month, he is also predicting uh, in the 666th year of Jehoiachin's captivity, the destruction of the temple on the 10th day of the fifth month. And this pat, this vision being on the 10th day of the fifth month uh, illustrates that. So, so he has this elders of Israel here, He's using that name symbolically to address basically the two sticks. Okay, what? now you said you said the six hundred and sixty-sixth year of Jehoiachin's captivity. Yeah, so Jehoiachin is captive for thirty-six years. Right, but if you continue the count of his captivity, the six hundred and sixty-sixth year of his captivity is seventy A.D. Okay. Right. So so that 36 years of his captivity is a symbol of the period of 666 years. And it occurs 36 years after the close of probation for the Jews. So there's 36 years at the beginning of that 666 years and 36 years at the end. And that begins with Jehoiachin's captivity in 597 B.C. OK. Right. So, so Ezekiel is predicting both destructions of the temple, the first and the second temple, using this uh, span of Jehoiachin's captivity and the tenth day of the fifth month as a symbol. It was also one year since his last time when he lay on his left side. So he lay on, lay on his left side 390 days. So that, yeah. so that was like the last day he done that was like a year prior to this year prophecy being given. Right. So he finishes on the 10th day of the fifth month after he finishes lying on his left side for 390 days. Yeah. Well, it was a year before. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. The year. OK, so this is so this is one year. After so I think. One year before he finishes, what are you saying? 
from when he started lying on his his left side. This is one year to the to. Uh, yes, I think it was the September. I'm not. I'm not too sure if the you you're, you're mentioning like the the biblical date, but I'm just going by the first of September. So it was five, first first of September five ninety one. I think. Hold on. Um, yeah, I think it was. Uh, yeah, maybe you're right. Actually, it was the tenth day of the fifth month. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm I'm wrong there. Yeah, it was the biblical date. Yeah, so it's the biblical date. So, so, so when he finishes lying on his left side, that's going to be five ninety one, on the tenth day of the fifth month, which Correct. is um, actually August fourteenth. On on yes. June. And, but so one year to the day after he finished lying on his left side, that's going to be the last day when he lies on his left side, uh, he's going to have the third vision. So so it's he has his first vision, and 390 days later, he, he lies on his left side for the last day. And that's the 10th day of the fifth month. And then... A year later, he's going to have his third vision. Okay, yeah. now, as, as a question, you had done a chart of this, Theodore. Yeah. And I believe it is your chart number 328. Um, well, it, yeah, it might have been. Uh, uh, <laughs> One time, my charts kind of get moved around, um, but because uh, I delete some charts when they end up. But I have it here. Uh, let me see. I'll find it this way. Yeah, because then you can see it clearly. Right. So I'm, I'm going to pause my share. Okay. I mean, there's a few different charts I have. Some are, are a little more. This one here. Um, yeah, so I'll share my screen here. Okay, Here, I'm gonna have to stop the share. You're gonna have to reshare yours again. Is it? Okay. There you go. Okay. So this one is Ezekiel's literal 390 and 40 days. So um, I'm gonna make it a bit bigger so people can see it. Um, so what you have is July 21st, 592 BC. That's the fifth day of the fourth month. Um, so obviously 365 days is going to bring you July 21st, 591 BC. And then 25 days more. So remember in Millerite history, there's these 25 days between July 21st and August 15th. So here I'm kind of just counting inclusively. So I'm counting the number of days. So when he finishes uh, lying, this is not the best diagram. It's a little bit hard to, because it looks kind of funny how it's done. You know, get this out of the way too. Um, so you can see here the 390 days. So the last day he lies on his left side, you know, so that evening when he goes to bed, it's going to be the 10th day of the fifth month ending. Right? Right. And and then the next day, he's going to begin lying on his right side for 40 days. And that's going to be August 15th. So you can see the July 21st and August 15th date there. Right. And, and then you're going to have, of course, uh, his second vision, which happens on September 7th. That's the fifth day of the sixth month on the biblical calendar in the sixth year of Jehoiachin's captivity. Um, 
that's actually going to be during that period of 40 days where he's still lying on his right side. And then, um, and, uh, and then the 20th day of the sixth month is when he's going to end this. Now, this is an old chart, so I'm not sure if this chart I use the, the biblical days uh, or the biblical calendar or the Babylonian calendar. So right. um, I know I have another chart of this. Here's another one, just an example in the center. You can see it again. And I just kind of put August 15th and the 10th day of the fifth month here. So this is kind of simplified. Right. Left side, right side. The idea is when when I presented this the first time uh, regarding uh, this July uh, 18, like the 10th day of the fifth month as a symbol of July 18, 2020. Um, uh, people had a hard time understanding why I didn't add the 390 days and the 40 days together because he lies on his his side for 430 days, 390 plus 40. But the idea is he makes this, this uh, mock-up of Jerusalem under siege, and, and he has to face that lying on his left side for 390 days. And then he faces it lying on his right side for 40 days. So he has to flip over to look at this uh, mock-up. Both times he's he's facing this um, mock-up of the siege, and he's predicting the siege more specifically, right, when the siege is going to begin. But you can see here on this chart, you can see the 10th day of the fifth month that he, that he finishes lying on his left side, and then he's going to start on his right side on the next day, August 15th. And then you can see um, his, his vision of Ezekiel 20, September 1st, 590 BC. That's the 10th day of the fifth month. And then um, four years after that, the temple is going, going to be destroyed on the 10th day of the fifth month, which is, not, which is August 18, um, 586. I think that might be right. And then the 10th day of the fifth month, which should be August 6th, 70 AD. Um, but anyway, we got the all these 10th days of the fifth month. There's four of them. And we have a similar thing in the book of Ezekiel when it comes to, or the book of Ezekiel, the book of Revelation when it comes to the 26th day of the fourth month. We have all these iterations of, of the 26th day of the fourth month. Yeah, I think this is the original picture that I drew. So this is on slide 275. This is the one that I drew for the presentation when I was at, at the School of the Prophets. Right. So this is where I draw the 390, the 10th day, the 5th month, August 5th. And then, um, so I'm not sure why I have August 2nd. So I think I the other... This is the wrong calendar. I was trying to use the biblical calendar instead of the Babylonian. So this was this was when I was still, we didn't have the, I, I made some mistakes here. But anyway, so this should be September 1st, 590 BC. But it's still the 10th day of the fifth month. Right. Yeah. So, okay. I hope, hopefully that helps. I'll stop share. You can share yours again. Okay. So people can get an idea that there, there's something here that we we still don't fully understand. Well, part of part of why I was asking the question regarding these charts. Yeah. As as we had studied previously, we had done a presentation that you had led out in. And it's presentation number 33 on the studies in Ezekiel. Okay. Now, that study was in reference to Ezekiel 20, which is what we're examining right now. Mm -hmm. That study was done on October 6th of 2020. Okay. 
Had anybody ever looked at the biblical date, the biblical Gregorian date of that study? Okay, so if you go to October 6, 2020, you're saying? Yes. Uh, so that's the 18th day of the seventh month. So Tishri. Yeah. symbolically, 18th day, 187, again, yeah. that we were addressing this. And this is where I had the information that you had this one chart, and it was chart number 328. You introduced that in that study. And yeah. it, was, it was fairly detailed showing the fact that in this, with Ezekiel, we had three times that the 10th day of the fifth month was applied. And then as, as you and Stephen are both bringing out, we also have this fourth time dealing with the 7th of August of 70 AD when the temple is destroyed. Yeah. Yet on this chart, from that study, from study number 33, you also have reference to the fifth day of the 10th month. Okay, yeah, so the fifth day of the 10th month is going to be when the person comes, um, the escapee arrives. Right. So the escapee comes to him to tell him that the temple has been destroyed. It's an eyewitness. And that's going to be, yeah, that's going to be the escapee. So when he, when the siege begins, um, he is told of the start of the siege on the 10th day of the 10th month, right? Even though he's 500 miles away, he's going to be told about what's happening in Jerusalem, that the siege right. is beginning, that he's predicted. And then he's going to be told, you know, about his wife dying and and all these things. And then he's going to be told that, that he's going to be mute or dumb. That is, he's not going to prophesy against Israel until the escapee comes from the destruction of Jerusalem to tell him of it. And on that day, his mouth will be open. And that's going to happen the evening before. So the evening before, he's going to begin prophesying. That's Ezekiel 33. And... And then it's going to give the date in Ezekiel 33, verse 21. Then it's going to say that the escapee has arrived on that date, on the uh, 10th day of the fifth, uh, the fifth day of the 10th month, right? So you're right. going to have the escapee arrive. And there's a whole bunch of things about that that tells us a lot about the biblical calendar. One is that the day starts at evening before, not, not in the morning. Um uh, but also uh, just the fact that the escapee comes, he's not going to come a year and a half later. So if you just used a, a, a fall to fall calendar in Ezekiel or just a spring to spring, the period of the siege would be a hundred uh, would be a year and a half. Right. And the time that the escapee comes would be um, a year and a half later. Right. So it's going to be three years. Anyway, that period of time from when the siege begins, because it begins in the ninth year, right, on the 10th, in the 10th month, on the 10th day of the month. And the okay. escape becomes in the 12th year on the fifth day of the 10th month. And so that would be three years. And so either you have to have um, a period of, I, I think it's going to be two and a half years for the siege and six months or it's going to have to be a year and a half and a year and a half. I can't remember which calendar does which. But uh, it, it creates problems. That's one of the problems in Ezekiel. Uh, so, and that has to do with the fact that, you know, we have spring to spring or fall, fall calendars and those months become different. So in order to get it to be two years from when the siege begins to when the escapee arrives, you need to have two different calendars one has to be spring to spring and one has to be fall to fall 
So the years of the captivity are fall to fall. The year of the siege is not counted in the year of the captivity. It's counted on a spring to spring calendar. But anyway, I know that's a rather complicated detail. But this is, you know, really quite fascinating when you start to look at Ezekiel in detail. It gives us a lot of chronological information. And, and some of it is hidden, hidden as well. That is, you have to really dig to see these details in Ezekiel. Exactly. Now, in the chat, we'd had a point made about Ezekiel 24. Yet I'm not quite understanding the, the implication with what we're addressing right now. Well, that's going to be the, uh, the start of the siege that's made. Okay. Right? That's the start so, of the siege. Yeah, so the siege starts... Um, on the, and then we got a chart here that was done here. Ezekiel on his left side the last time. That's, I can't read that chart. But anyway, um, yeah, so you have the start of the siege. So that's the 10th day of the 10th month in the ninth year of Jehoiachin's captivity. And then, so when the escapee comes in Ezekiel 33, 21, in the 12th year of the captivity on the 10th day of the 5th month, or the 10th month, the 5th day of the 10th month, that's going to be uh, three years minus five days later, right? So this this creates a problems for, for biblical chronologists uh, when they try to figure this out. And a lot of them that I've dealt with, they, they take it that there's a year and a half from when the temple is destroyed when to when the escapee arrives to tell Ezekiel. And that's unrealistic. I mean, a year and a half, it's it's a four month journey. Right. So six months is kind of reasonable considering the circumstances, but Ezekiel's not gonna hear of it until, you know, a year and a half after it occurs. That doesn't make any sense. So. So there has to be two calendars in use there in the book of Ezekiel. Okay. Now in Ezekiel 20, verse 2, Then came the word of the Lord unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto the elders of Israel, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Are ye come to inquire of me? As I live, saith the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. Here again, the translators, when they were addressing this, turned to Ezekiel 14.3. Again, in the vision just prior. Because that verse reads, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? So, in this vision, dealing with the abominations found within the church, God is asking Ezekiel, should I even think of answering these people? They have held on to their idols. They have their stumbling blocks before their face. Now we come to Ezekiel 20, and God says, I will not be inquired of by you. Can we think of another time in Scripture where there was someone that had chosen their path, walked contrary to God, and then decided he needed God's counsel? Well, we do have Saul. Exactly. And how did Saul, in, instead of inquiring of God, how did Saul then seek his information? Well, he went to the necromancer of Endor. The Witch of Endor.
So later in this same chapter, in Ezekiel 20, the comment is made, for when you offer your gifts, when you make your sons to pass through the fire, you pollute yourself with all your idols, even unto this day. And shall I be inquired of by you, O house of Israel? As I live, saith the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. So, 28 verses later, in verse 31, using the symbol of seven times, not only that, but the symbol of four times, seven times. God first says, I will not be inquired of by you. And he repeats himself 28 verses later. I will not be inquired of by you. Is there anything symbolic that we can draw from this? Well, wouldn't it be well, the second comes to me is, uh, I was going to say Proverb 1, uh, 24 through, well, if you can start at 23, it goes right down to the end of that passage about people ignoring God, and finally he'll just ignore them, and they'll have to suffer the consequences of their unrepented sins, because they're repenting, because they, they come to the end of their rope, so to speak, and now they think they can have recourse to God, but they've ignored him and rebelled against him all this time, and it's just too late. Okay, Brother Chris. I was going to say, if you repeated it four times, then it'd be the uh, fourth angel's message, which or the second angel of the message. Okay, thank you, Brother William. So, here we have symbols, and are we dealing with this regarding the church in Ezekiel's time, or are we dealing with this in regard to the church today? I'd say both. Okay. Now, in Ezekiel 20, verse 4, Wilt thou judge them, son of man? Wilt thou judge them? Cause them to know the abominations of their fathers. Is this verse a doubling? Is the question being asked a doubling? It yes, appears it that way. So when we have a doubling, we're dealing with the second angel's message. That's our philosophy at this point. And the second angel's message First, we're told to give God glory, but we're also informed that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Because in this, Ezekiel is asked, will you judge them? Will you judge them? Will you cause them to know the abominations of their fathers? Will you show them the vision that I gave you in Ezekiel 8? That goes through the abominations within the church. Will you then show them scripture by scripture, line upon line, the abominations and their effect 
when we came to Ezekiel 9. Now in Ezekiel 20, verse 5, And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, In the day when I chose Israel, and lifted up mine hand unto the seed of the house of Jacob, and made myself known unto them in the land of Egypt, when I lifted up mine hand unto them, saying, I am the Lord your God. Now, the translators gave reference back to Exodus 6, verse 8. And I will bring you in unto the land concerning that, concerning the which I swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you for an heritage. I am the Lord. God gave a promise. Is he able to keep his promise? I'm sorry, the question again? Is God able to keep his promises? <laughs> yes. Did he give a promise to Abraham regarding what we call the promised land. Uh, well, yes. Did he repeat this promise to Isaac? Yes. And then did he repeat it a third time with Jacob? Yes. So here we have a situation. Our Heavenly Father is giving his word to three generations. And he is fulfilling his word in the fourth generation. Is that, do, do we see that as we're going through this? It seems apparent. Okay. So, we are now in the fourth generation in our time of this earth's history. We are the generation of the children of Israel unto whom God has given a promise. He has lifted up his hand and he has made himself known to us when he has lifted up his hand or when he has swore to us saying that he is the Lord. He is our God. Are we willing to take him at his word today? And how do we take him at his word? As Sister White had written, a character that is approved of God and man is to be preferred to wealth. The foundation should be laid broad and deep, resting on the rock of Christ Jesus. There are too many who profess to work from the true foundation, whose loose dealing shows them to be building on sliding sand. But the greatest tempest will sweep away their foundation, and they will have no refuge. Abraham regards the claims of justice and humanity. He obeys the rule as ye would that others should do unto you, so ye even so unto them. 
do ye even so unto them. Matthew 5, 12. He says to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou should say, I have made Abram rich. Genesis 14, 22. This is an example worthy of imitation. It illustrates the Christian maxim, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Leviticus 19, 18. Did Christ not repeat this? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Yes. Is this the first great commandment or the second great commandment? It's the second. second. Here we are being shown that character is how we can properly express our faith that God is able to do that which he promises. Because is not the character that we develop here going to be the character that we would have throughout all eternity? I'm pretty sure that's the way it is. Now, in case you need, this portion that we've just read came from Signs of the Times, 7th of February of 1884. Now we're going to read Manuscript 81, 1906. I present these matters before you. I am directed to say that the Lord has a great controversy with the men who have exalted themselves. Some have made nothingness of God. Then brought he me the way of the north gate before the house. And I looked and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And I fell on my face. And the Lord said unto me, Son of man, mark well, and behold with thine eyes, and hear with thine ears all that I say unto thee concerning all of the ordinances of the house of the Lord, and all of the lords thereof, all of the laws thereof. And mark well the entering of the house, with every going forth of the sanctuary. And thou shalt say to the rebellious, even to the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, O ye house of Israel, let it suffice you of all your abominations, in that ye have brought into my sanctuary strangers, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary, to pollute it, even mine house, when ye offer my bread, the fat and the blood, and they have broken my covenant because of all your abominations. And ye have not kept the charge, but ye have set keepers of my charge in my sanctuary for yourselves. Thus saith the Lord God, no stranger uncircumcised in heart nor uncircumcised in flesh shall enter into my sanctuary of any stranger that is among the children of Israel. And the Levites that are gone away far from me when Israel went astray, which went astray from me after their idols, they shall bear their iniquity. Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having charge at the gates of the house and ministering to the house. They shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people. And they shall stand before them to minister unto them. 
because they ministered unto them before their idols and caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity. Therefore, I have lifted up mine hand against them, saith the Lord God. And they shall bear their iniquity. And they shall not come near unto me to do the office of a priest unto me, nor to come near to any of my holy things in the most holy place. But they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed. I will make them keepers of the charge of the house for all the service thereof and for all that shall be done therein. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok that kept the charge of my sanctuary, when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me. And they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord God. They shall enter into my sanctuary, and they shall come near to my table to minister unto me, and they shall keep my charge. Ezekiel 44, 4 to 16. I present this matter to all who may have the wisdom to understand it. The Lord is no less strict today concerning the holiness of his servants. All who serve God with purity of soul will know that he is jealous and that his honor should be preserved. Many of the most glorious revelations recorded in the Bible were made by the Lord in the darkest days of the church's history. Is this not so today? Since days are like the darkest days and we are getting light, I would say, yes, it's true today. Okay. The Lord has given these revelations of his glory in order that men may be deeply impressed regarding the sacredness of his service. What kind of a message is being given to us now? Over the last several weeks, we have been being shown that we are not to have controversy between brothers. We are to be repenting of our sins. We are to be confessing our sins. We are to be seeking to become unified. The Lord has given these revelations of his glory in order that men may be deeply impressed. How much more deeply impressed do we need to become? Impressions have been made that should bear with solemn force on the mind, showing that God is God and that he has not lost his glory. Has man lost the glory of that God gave to him at creation? Well, yeah. Didn't they lose their robes law at the beginning? Exactly. But has God lost any of his glory? Negative. He requires the utmost fidelity in his service today. The impression must be left on human minds that God is holy and that he will vindicate his glory. Brothers and sisters, is there a test that has come upon the church today? Is the church not being tested to see whether or not it will accept all of the word of God, inclusive of the spirit of prophecy? Um, isn't that what we've been studying for the last um, decade or so? I agree. Study also the 20th chapter of Ezekiel. Here again, 
Mrs. White repeats what we have been reading. Thus saith the Lord God, in the day when I chose Israel and lifted up my hand under the seed of the house of Jacob and made myself known unto them in the land of Egypt, when I lifted up my hand unto them, saying, I am the Lord your God. In the day that I lifted up mine hand unto them, to bring them forth out of the land of Egypt, unto a land that I espied for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all nations and lands. Then I said unto them, Cast ye away, every man, the abominations of his eyes. And defile not yourself with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. In this chapter, God is saying, again, I've made a promise to you. You need to reach out to accept this promise by faith. For I have made myself known unto you. Whether you accept my word or you reject it is your choice. What are we willing to do? Now we find as we scroll down a little bit. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statutes, and they despised my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. And my Sabbaths they have greatly polluted. Then I said, I will pour out my fury on them in the wilderness to consume them. But I wrought for my name's sake, that it should not be polluted before the heathen in whose sight I brought them out. What's being referred to here when it's being said that the house of Israel walked against God in the wilderness and that they walked not in my, my statutes and they despised my judgments? That was the 40 years. Is it also not directly related to Leviticus 26? Yes. And how how do we describe Leviticus 26? What's occurring within this chapter? Uh, blessings and curses. If we refuse to accept God's blessing, then what are we choosing to accept? Curses. Would you rather be blessed or would you rather be cursed? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, the blessing part. <laughs> it, it's somewhat simple, isn't it? Well, um, you would think, but not so simple. <laughs> In this situation, if we refuse to walk in God's statutes, if we choose to despise God's judgments, are we not asking to be cursed? Oh, yeah. I was having a conversation the other night. I was speaking with a woman and I was complimenting the fact that she had chosen to accept the message of dress reform. Even though there were many sisters in her church that had said to her, you are dressing too conservatively. You need to lighten up. 
you need to dress more in keeping with the world than in the manner in which you are dressing. The comment that I made to her is, you are choosing then to honor God over man. In this situation, we are being given great light. Is the light that we have today greater than the light that has been given to any previous generation? Yes, sir. Without a doubt. So if we choose to reject the light that we are given, is there any hope for us? I would have to say no. Here the word of God plainly specifies the day that should be kept holy. The seventh day. And yet we see work being carried out by ministers, by physicians, by lawyers, and by rulers that will result in enforcing the Sunday law. Will not God punish this for this rebellion? He will surely punish as it is represented in the words, Ezekiel 20, verses 5 to 20, that she had copied. Walk ye not in the statutes of your fathers, neither observe their judgments, nor defile yourselves with your idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them and hollow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Brothers and sisters, I am aware of churches in my area where there are elders, leaders of the church, that are willing to say to their wives that the health message, even that of dress reform, is not important. It is not for our time. This was written for a time long past. Yeah, but so was Daniel. Yes. Daniel was written in a time long past. It shouldn't be for us then, right? Wrong. Exactly. Can we afford to set aside any of the word of God and say it's for a time long past? It would be arrogant. Would that not be presumption? As well. Yes, it Yes, it would. It's a form of blasphemy. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Amen. Amen. We have many things, we have many ways that we need to be looking at this. Here again, we are in the book of Ezekiel. The elders of Israel are being called to account where they have failed in appetite, where they have failed in presuming that they are doing everything right when they are not. When they have chosen the love of the world over the promises of God. Again, Will not God punish for this rebellion? He will surely punish, as is represented in the words, Ezekiel verses 5 through 20. 
we need to keep this in mind. Ezekiel 20, verse 6. In the day that I lifted up mine hand unto them to bring them forth of the land of Egypt into a land that I had espied for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. And then I said unto them, cast ye away every man, the abominations of his eyes, and defile yourselves, defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Are we not called to remove these abominations from our eyes? And are we not called to not defile ourselves with the idols of this world? If we're not willing to walk in the blessings, we will most certainly become accursed. Will we not become like those foolish Galatians? Will we not become, as Paul said, and ask, who has bewitched you? If we're not willing to be blessed of God, we will surely be cursed of him. But they rebelled against me and would not hearken unto me. They did not every man cast away the abominations of their eyes, neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish mine anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. Does Achan not represent to us the state of what we're seeing today where we have one man of the entire camp of Israel that after Jericho fell that he took for himself the golden wedge of Ophir and he took for himself a goodly Babylonish garment. When he took that Babylonish garment, symbolically, what was he doing? Uh, changing his character. How about that he was revealing his character? Well, yeah, okay. Whose character was he re rejecting? Christ. Are we called today to reject Christ's character? Oh, no. <laughs> but I wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted before the heathen among whom they were, in whose sight I made myself known unto them in bringing them forth out of the land of Egypt. We are soon to give a call. We are soon again to repeat Revelation 18. What is the call of Revelation 18? Well, it's the call to come out of Babylon. Correct. Come out of her, my people. 
what people are being called out. Is it not those that seek to become blessed rather than cursed? Yes. Are these not the people that would have Christ's character and accept that character so that God may then write upon their foreheads his new name? Wherefore, I caused them to go out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. Chiastically, what is God calling us to today? Is he calling us into the wilderness? Or is he calling us to leave a wilderness, to leave Jericho, to come to his promised land a land without sin a land without temptation a land without tears And I saw that if God had changed the Sabbath from the seventh to the first day, he would have changed the writing of the Sabbath commandment written on the tables of stone, which are now in the ark in the most holy place of the temple in heaven. See Revelation eleven nineteen, And it would read thus, the first day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. But I saw that it read the same as when written on the tables of stone by the finger of God and delivered to Moses in Sinai. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, Exodus 20.10. So here we have Exodus 20.10 referenced with Ezekiel 20.10. I saw that the Holy Sabbath is and will be the separating wall between the true Israel of God and the unbelievers. And that the Sabbath is the great question to unite the hearts of God's dear waiting saints and if one believed and kept the sabbath and received the blessing attending it and then gave it up and broke the holy commandment they would shut the gates of the holy city against themselves as sure as there was a god that rules in the heaven above i saw that god had children who do not see and keep the sabbath they had not rejected the light on it. And at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth. Hosea 6, verses 2 and 3. And proclaim the Sabbath more fully. Hosea 6, 2. After two days, will he revive us? In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain unto the earth. This enraged the church and the nominal Adventists, as they could not refute the Sabbath truth. And at this time, God's chosen all saw clearly that we had the truth, and they came out and endured the persecution with us. And I saw that the sword, famine, pestilence, and great confusion in the land. Ezekiel 7, 10 to 19, compared with 2 Esdras 15, 5 to 27. Now, before we dive into these, we're going at this point to ask if there's any questions over what we've read. 
We're going to need to go into this further this coming Sabbath. Because this has a lot of information for us to consider at this time. This part is saying this enraged the church. This enraged nominal Adventists. Those that are paying lip service to the coming of Christ but not accepting his statutes and not wanting to accept his blessings. Do we have any questions or comments of what we have studied today at this time? Just a small comment on verse 6. Yes. It says that the Lord had espied the land. So um, if you read. Yeah, I'm going back to it. Yes. Um, yeah, so the land that the Lord had espied for them. So if you read uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, it's uh, 387. Okay. Elmer says it was the people that had the idea to send. What happened? Somebody just played some music. That's all. Okay. Sorry, Stephen. <laughs> so Elmer, she she just makes the comment that uh, it was the people's idea to send spies under the land, and that their result of that, and in a sense, the report meant that they uh, brought disbelief and they've wandered then 40 years in the wilderness. Right. But here, I'm just sort of picking up, you know, that there wasn't any need for them to send spies into the land. You know, that the Lord, they should have trusted the Lord. Here, the Lord had already um, spied it for them. And that, um, now, I think, I think Moses said to the Lord, okay, shall we send spies? And the Lord permitted it. Um, but it um, wasn't necessary. It's just what I'm picking up. Okay. Thank you for that. Any other comments, questions, or thoughts? Okay, shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, from what we have read today, from what we have studied, from what we have discussed, we are seeing even more our great need of you. Father, We do not wish to be cursed. We recognize that we need to follow your statutes. We recognize, Father, that we need to understand your judgments. We need to be directed by you and guided by your spirit. We thank you, Father, for this time that we may, that we have spent together. We ask, Father, for your blessing upon those that have attended this session today and for those that will view this and hear it later. Help us, Father, that we may be prepared to accept Christ's righteousness, that we may indeed become righteous by faith, that we may accept what you have told us is important and that we may set aside that which man tells us is important. Direct us this Sabbath. Help us so that we may become those that can give this final message to the world Give us strength, give us courage, 
and impart to us your wisdom. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, Father, we praise you. For this, Father, we ask. In the name of Jesus, amen. Yeah.